Welcome to our channel. We are Red and April Off Grid. We have just moved into the off grid passive design home that we built and designed ourselves. Last week, we finished and installed our main entry door. This week, Red will be installing some beautiful solid wood shelves in the kitchen, and he will be working in the master bathroom installing the toilet, sink, and vanity. We're starting off today with a little side project that I've been wanting to get to. We wanted to create a little coffee nook over by the refrigerator above this little piece of cabinet that we have, so we needed a couple of shelves. I dug through the shop and came up with this old piece of hard, curly sugar maple that I bought from a guy with his own mill in Ohio. It's a cool piece, but a funny shape, and so I was excited to finally find the perfect use for it. I was able to get two shelves cut out of it. This is really beautiful wood, and it was already about the right thickness, so once I cut it to size, all I needed to do is sand it down. It was really challenging getting these two shelves out of the piece. The piece was angled in a funny shape, and so it was definitely a challenge. I laid it all out and did the best I could, got it as wide as I could, but there's still maybe a couple inches narrower than I would have really liked. And you, you can see that little bevel on the corner. I just got them as wide as I possibly could, and, and I'll put that bevel to the inside towards the refrigerator. We decided to use the graying aged wood accelerator on this, or at least give it a try. I've never used it on maple, and I was curious to see what effect it would have. Maple usually has a very yellowy, kind of amber tone, and we wanted to tone that down, bring in some darker colors. And so we decided to use this graying and see what it did. The accelerator dries quickly and leaves a gray, dusty finish. Now for the magic moment, to apply some linseed oil cut with some citrus thinner. Oh, this really looks amazing. I, I love applying oil. It really brings out the color and tone. And we were really surprised with what this brought out. It's really bringing out dark, rich browns, which you normally do not see in maple like this. Maple is usually very yellowy, very amber. This is like a dark, rich chocolate to honey browns. It's really gorgeous. It's also making the grain pop. It's making the curly figure of the wood really shine and come out. I really love what the darkening what that grain compound did to this maple. It's really cool. This is so satisfying. This is a really amazing result. I've seen this kind of look on a curly maple, but only when they used a brown dye of some kind. And so I'm getting that same figure popping coloration of a, like a brown dye, but with the aging compound. It looks really natural, really vibrant and gorgeous. Man, I, I really am impressed with what this has done. And these darker chocolate tones are going to go much better with the house, the floors especially, than the yellowy tones would have. I like the live edge look on this board too. It has a, a natural live edge that I, I preserved when I cut these out. It has a little bark on it, which I oiled up to. It looks real nice, especially in a small shelf like this. We're still working on decorating the home, and this spot above the glass sliding door needed something. April found this tapestry that she'd received as a gift from her great-grandmother. It's a scene of an old mill, and so we put it up on the wall to see how it looked. It's not what we would have imagined for the space, but we really like old things, and it was a great opportunity to bring in some family history into the room, and it's grown on us, and we just love it. The master bathroom is the last unfinished room in the house. We need to install our toilet, sink, and shower. So I'm getting started on the toilet first. I'm just removing the plastic protection from around this 3-inch pipe that we had stubbed up through the pad. We poured this pad about a year ago, and so it's been a while. We're just getting back to it. It's fun to finally finish this up. I'm chipping away at the concrete here. We left a little bit of a lip where it goes up against the pipe, and I just need to chip that off. Here I'm using a little specialty cutter that allows you to cut the pipe from the inside. Unfortunately, I dropped it off. It just fell off as I was cutting, and I was, but fortunately I was able to use a magnet to pull it out. At first, I, was, I thought it was lost in there. I had forgot to put a plug in the pipe to keep that kind of thing from happening. Uh, so now I put a, some cloth down in there to, so, you know, in case it falls off again, it doesn't drop all the way down into the pipe. This cutter allows me to cut the pipe off slightly below the level of the concrete. At first, I had planned to use a toilet flange that goes over the outside of the pipe. Unfortunately, there's not enough of a gap between the concrete and the outside of the pipe to do that. And I was really worried at first because I didn't think that they made a flange that went on the inside of the pipe for a 3-inch pipe. 
So I, I was like, oh no, what have I done? I'm going to have to chip out the concrete. So anyway, I got online and looked it up, and sure enough, they do make a piece, a flange piece, that fits on the inside of a 3-inch diameter pipe. So I had to make a special trip to town and get one. With the new flange in hand, I'm ready to do my final fit-up preparations. It's a good thing I cut off the pipe about a half an inch below the grade of the concrete, because I need that room to accommodate a bevel on the inside of the flange. Uh, otherwise, the flange would not go down flush against the concrete. I needed to do a little bit more chipping around that edge to get it nice and flush where the flange will fit down completely flat against the floor, then vacuumed and cleaned up everything, just getting ready to glue up the flange and put it in place. I'm ready to glue it and put it in place. It's always a little nerve-wracking. You want to make sure that it goes down flush, make sure you have everything right, and that it's oriented correctly so that the bolts that hold your toilet down come up in the right location. So after carefully putting that in place, I'm ready to start pre-drilling the holes into the concrete. I'm using my rotary hammer drill for this. It's a wonderful tool. It makes such quick work of drilling into concrete. Just had to use a really tiny little drill bit and then screw it into place with special concrete screws. And now I'm just unboxing the toilet. We just picked this up at Lowe's. It's a low cost option, not the lowest cost. We wanted one that was a little bit less expensive, but they were sold out of that one. This one was slightly more expensive since it has a dual flush option, which is kind of nice. Allows you to use lower water if you want to. The toilet came with pretty much everything I needed for setup. It had a wax ring, so I put that in place, set the toilet over the wax ring and carefully pushed it down in position, bolted it in place, and now I'm just working on attaching the top bowl. There's just two bolts that hold the top bowl on, and then I'm ready to move on to the seat. It came with that too. Also just two bolts there, and we're ready to go. I had to remove a, a sticker that was on the toilet. It's always got stickers on it, and they're hard to get off. Fortunately, April had an adhesive remover that worked well for that, and now I'm doing a little test flush. It all seems to be working well, and so I'm getting ready to put the top on the back bowl. These dual flush toilets have a special back cover that allows you to choose the amount of water you use, and it has a little plunger that goes down into the toilet and pushes a button. Kind of neat. After letting the oil finish on those shelves cure for a couple of days, we're ready to put them in. The first thing was to figure out the height and position that we wanted them, and then to start figuring out where to locate the brackets. I need to get out my stud finder and figure out if there was a stud in the vicinity. Backsplash height was the next consideration to go 4 inches or go all the way up to the bottom of the top shelf. We decided to just go 4 inches. We ordered some fancy metal brackets online and those have come in. We're ready to install those. I was able to locate a stud on the left side that would work, but on the right I have to use the drywall anchors. I really hate using drywall anchors. I only use them when I absolutely have to. They make about a million different kinds of them and half of them don't seem to work. I always struggle, but eventually I was able to get all these brackets uh, mounted. Just one more to go here and I'll be all finished up. This is really the hardest part of the whole job, just getting your brackets mounted and level. Once that was done, I put these shelves on and pre-drilled into those carefully. I'm going to use small, short little screws to attach these. And then a quick rummage through the shop, and I was able to find the correct length of screws to attach these. Really like the way these turned out. I, the wood is just so gorgeous. The natural green texture of this is just amazing, and I love the color. Really love the natural live edge as well. They look amazing here. The last step to finish off our little coffee nook here was to install the backsplash. We're just using the same material that we used on the backsplash in the rest of the kitchen, but only going four inches high. I've cut the trim pieces already and attached those to this piece that's already cut to height. Now I'm just applying glue to everything and I'll be ready to put it in place. Once that is thoroughly coated, I'll be ready to just push this into place. It's so nice. You just set it into place, press it up against the wall, and you're done. Well, maybe not quite done. I did. You can see that piece of tape along the bottom. That's the piece of tape that I put there in preparation of the silicone bead that I'll need to put along the bottom to seal that connection between the counter and the backsplash. And now I'm ready to apply that silicone. I've got it taped on both sides. We're using a special order metallic silicone that is beautiful, works perfectly here, makes a great transition, uh, blends in perfectly with this backsplash. We're really loving these concrete countertops as well. This particular section has a really beautiful look. And here it is all set up with our electric kettle, some of our favorite mugs and coffee. It's in a convenient location right by the fridge. Back over in the master bathroom, we're ready to start on the vanity sink cabinet. 
We have a large dresser that's been in one of the kids' rooms for years that we brought with us from Texas, and we wanted to use it in the home. And so when we designed the bathroom for this house, we were designing it with this cabinet in mind. So we made this space the perfect size to use this dresser as the vanity. The only thing is the dresser isn't quite as deep as we need. So it'll sit out from the wall a few inches, giving some space for the plumbing, so that works out great. But I need a spacer to fill that gap. And that's what I'm working on here. I'm cutting down a 1x12 board that'll be just the perfect size for this. I'm walking over to make sure it fits. If it does, I'll come back and finish up the piece. This piece of wood that I'm using was a lucky find at a local big box store. It's just a piece of 1x12 pine. We were actually in buying lumber for some shelves that we were putting in the pantry way back. And uh, mixed in amongst those boards was this piece that had a bird's eye pattern. So we picked it up, of course, but it was too nice to use for shelves, so I set it aside, and it turned out to be just the thing for using for this spacer behind this chest of drawers, because it's pine, it'll go good with the tone of the wood, but it's also a nice character piece in and of itself. Bird's eye patterning is really rare in woods, uh, particularly in pine. You see it more in maple, bird's eye maple you've probably heard of. It's pretty rare in pine, so this was just a really nice find, and to be able to buy it for the cost of a normal pine board was really satisfying. While I was waiting for that finish to cure, I decided to go ahead and pull out our sink and see how it looks on the dresser slash vanity, and also get ready to drill the hole for the drain. This vessel sink will sit right on top and minimize the amount of work that we have to do to make this dresser work as a vanity. Next up, I gathered up all the supplies to do some work on the drain, pulled out the dresser a little bit so that I could get behind here and work, and I'm getting ready to just get as far as I possibly can on the drain and get the fresh water brought in as well so that that'll all be finished and then I can just scoot the dresser back into place permanently. Using an old dresser as a vanity has its special challenges. I had to remove the back section in the middle of the dresser so that I could access it from the back. This particular dresser was a really nice setup for doing this. It has a couple of doors in the middle, so once I remove those, that'll provide a convenient place to put the plumbing, and we'll still have full use of the drawers on either side. I'm just doing a little prefab and glue up here while I'm outside. It has a real strong odor, so it's nice to do outdoors. It really worked out well pulling that dresser out a few inches from the wall and leaving space for the drain to operate behind it. It was just nice not to have to cut up the dresser even more to make the drain go out the bottom and stuff. Really minimize the work that I had to do to the dresser. Here I brought my supplies in. I'm just doing a little fit up and testing to make sure all of it's going to work well when I go to install the sink. I now have the dresser positioned and leveled and so I'm ready to install that bird's eye pine board that I've made. And I need to put in a support board along the back to attach it to. I'm going to attach it to this support board, and it will sit on top of and overlap the dresser by about an inch on the other side, and I'll screw it in to that side and then silicone it to seal it. The backboard is ready to be installed now, so I've already drilled the hole for the faucet, and now I'm pre-drilling the holes to attach it to the backboard and to the cabinet. But before I do that, I want to go ahead and install the faucet. This is a standalone single hole faucet for use with a vessel sink. One feature about this that I searched hard for and finally found is I wanted a faucet to where when you reach up to turn off the faucet with wet drippy hands, that the water that you leave on the faucet knob won't drip down and not go into the vessel. It needs to drip down, hit the nozzle of the faucet, and then flow into the sink. And so this particular one had a design to where the water that drips off your hands will find its way into the vessel sink. And so that was something I looked hard for and finally found one that would work. The installation on this was super fast and easy. Just have to feed through the hot and cold lines and then attach it with a big nut on the bottom. With that installed, I'm finally ready to mount this backboard. I'm using silicone along the back to form a water seal. And then next I'll put in a strip of tape along here, masking tape, so that when I set this board down and that silicone squeezes out, that it doesn't squeeze out onto my countertop. Now I'm ready to go ahead and set it in place. This board is a little twisted. It had a bit of a warp to it, and it was already to the right thickness, so I didn't want to try to plane the warp out of it. And so I planned to screw it in. That was another reason to screw it in, so I can use the screws to take that twist out of the board. I will mention that the piece that I'm putting in back here, this bird's eye pine board, is a little bit light right now. It doesn't quite match, but with time it will age and the colors will darken to more of that orange tone. It'll match the 
countertop much better over time. Here's an example of what that aging looks like on an antique pine chest of drawers that we have. I made that bottom ring for it and it aged nicely over time to match. And here's a quick shot of me making the hot and cold connections underneath the sink. You can see the little space that I've created in here to work with. It's small, but it's enough. And now the faucet is fully connected and working, although I keep the hot and cold lines shut off for now. I'm now ready to install the backsplash. Since this is such a long vanity, we decided to only install it along the back. And we have a large mirror that came with the dresser that we'll be mounting that'll take up most of the space. So I'm not going to put the backsplash all along the back wall. I'm just going to put it where it'll show on either side and below the mirror. I put on the Schluter aluminum edging pieces in the areas that will show. And I've applied some mortar and I'm getting ready to put the tile on. These tile pieces are about a foot tall, so we decided to use the full height and go across. We picked up these tiles at a discount store. They have metal accents, which matches the theme that we have going on in the rest of the house. And the rest is made up of white with kind of a glassy beveled edge look. So I think it'll go nice. It looks funny not going all the way across here, but like I said, all that will be covered up by the mirror. I've now finished all the grouting and cleaned that up. That's always one of the hardest parts is getting it all nice and clean. And then April came back in with the sealer and sealed all of the grout lines. With the backsplash done, I'm ready to get the mirror. It's a big, heavy mirror. So I had to go over to our shipping container and get that out. And I'm just bringing it over to the house. We're trying to figure out how to install this. It's quite heavy. It has hangers on either side, but they're not in the right position to line up with the studs on the back wall. So I brought out the handy stud finder and located the studs, made some notes on how far they were over from the wall, and then set the mirror in place. I found some scrap wooden blocks that were the right height, and I have it sitting on those blocks on both sides, so it's at the right height, and the blocks are carrying the weight. I just have to make sure it doesn't fall forward. I've pre-drilled some holes, and now I'll be using some heavy-duty screws to permanently mount the mirror. These screws will blend in quite well, although they will be slightly visible. I just couldn't think of any other way to fix it firmly. Now I'm doing some taping because I'm going to apply a couple layers of finish to the lower portion of the mirror and the entire surface of the cabinet, in order to give it much better waterproofing. The first thing that I'll apply is a coat of wax-free shellac. I don't know what type of finish was used on this dresser originally, but shellac forms a barrier that you can put in between any two finishes, and it bonds any two finishes together. So it's perfect for this type of application. So I put that down, and now I can put anything I want over the finish without them conflicting. Next, I'm applying a coat of water-based polyacrylic. Polyacrylic is an extremely tough, durable, virtually waterproof material that will be excellent for use in the bathroom. It has excellent wear resistance. And after I put on several coats of this, it should be a good, tough surface for a bathroom countertop. I've used it on several countertops in the past and really liked the results. It seems to perform very well, so I'll put on two or three coats. Another thing I like about this water-based polyacrylic is it has a much lower VOC output than the oil-based finishes. So much less harmful fumes, it doesn't smell as bad, so it's nice to use in an interior space. It also dries quickly, so you can recoat in just a couple of hours. Once the finish was dry, I just needed to apply a bead of silicone along the back edge, so I did the usual taping and application of the silicone, pull the tape off real quick while the silicone is still wet, and that finishes up the countertop portion. Now moving on to the sink install. It came with its own drain and I'm taking out the instructions and reading through those trying to figure out how the drain seals to the glass vessel itself. We did have to separately buy that little ring that you can see sitting on the counter there. That'll go between the counter and the bottom of the sink. I've never done a sink like this before and I was unsure about how the drain sealed up against the glass. I was under the impression at first that it should seal from the top side, but then I figured out it actually seals from underneath. Well, with that sorted, I'm ready to set it in place. I just set it down through the ring and gaskets and everything, and then from the underneath, attach it with a nut. This installation was ridiculously easy. You just set it in place and then come in from the underside, put on a gasket and put the nut on, tighten that down, get it in place, super easy. And then this is a separate piece that you would attach with another nut, tighten everything down and get it positioned. And then I'll be ready to attach the rest of the drain, which I've already prefabbed. 
Well, this is almost done. Hopefully it'll just be a matter of making these final connections with my prefab fittings here. I had it taped off to protect it, remove the tape, and now I'm getting everything situated underneath here. It all just screws together with gaskets in between all those screw fittings. So just get them in place, get them kind of snug, make sure it's all lined up well, and then tighten them all down. And that should just about do it. Tighten these down one last little bit, and then I'll be ready to turn the water on at the valves over in the manifold. Had to move something out of the way, turn those valves on, and we're ready to do a test. We bled all of the air out of the line, and now we have water in our new sink. It seems to be working well. Next up was to check for leaks. So we looked under the sink and in between, and it all looks good. No visible leaks, so I think we're okay here. I have a fully functioning sink. The last thing I need to do is to cut down this drawer. This was the top center drawer, and of course I had to remove it since we have the plumbing back in behind there, but I want to put the face back in. So I'm just cutting the front of the drawer off and I'll put what's left of the face and the first part of the drawer back in just to fill up the hole. The lower center portion had two drawers and we only had to permanently remove one. The lowest drawer was, is still usable, so we actually only lost two drawers out of this whole deal. That leaves us with three large drawers on each side and one in the middle. Lots of usable storage in this vanity. Well, we love the way this vanity turned out. That sink really adds a nice pop of color. I love the blue. This vanity was the perfect size and perfect application for the bathroom. It was at no cost to us, and we love the look of it in here. We still need to finish up the shower in here, but my next project is going to be the kitchen table. I'm going to be building it special for the home out of salvaged hardwoods, so join us next week. Thank you so much for watching. We try to post a new video every Saturday morning. We invite you to subscribe and follow along as we build a more sustainable lifestyle in our off-grid homestead.